Bom, eu vou fazer só essa apresentação em português, que acho que isso eu consigo aqui, dizer quem eu sou, e, uh, e depois eu, vocês me desculpem, eu vou falar inglês, que é mais fácil para mim falar sobre esse assunto em inglês. Uh, pois é, Estela, para mim, desculpa em inglês, não é, Estela? <risos> Um, bom, de qualquer jeito, eu sou a Ana Thunberg, acho que a maioria de vocês já me conhecem. Um, eu trabalho na Universidade de Surrey, aqui uma vista aérea da universidade. Acho que ninguém de vocês ainda foi me visitar lá. Um, as colegas da Rosane, lá de, da URGS, já foram lá trabalhar comigo. Só convidar que a gente não. Um, um, <risos> podem vir. Enfim, postdoc e tudo. E só o Gustavo trabalhou lá comigo, fez o doutorado lá. E é muito gostoso a cidadezinha de Guilford. Fica aqui pertinho de Londres. Então dá para ir vir no mesmo dia. Mas ao mesmo tempo é uma cidade que dá para fazer tudo de bicicleta, no campo. Tem tudo, é bem gostoso. Ah, então, estou esperando visitas. Né? E o meu. Ah, eu, eu fui formada em História aqui na, aqui na USP, na, na Copeleste. E até pedi para o Uber me deixar aqui na entrada para eu poder atravessar o prédio da História e matar saudades, tirar uma fotinha. Ah, e é um prazer para mim sempre vir outra vez aqui para a USP compartilhar a minha pesquisa com o pessoal aqui. Então, uh, depois da USP, eu fiz um, eu, eu trabalhei na Lumen, da aula de inglês na Lumen, e comecei a me interessar mais por linguística do que por história. Mas eu terminei o curso de história porque meu pai disse, ah, termine na graduação, eu já estava no meio, então terminei a graduação. Aí fui fazer um mestrado em linguística em Edimburgo e gostei tanto, tanto, tanto. E aí consegui uma bolsa do CNPq, fiquei lá para fazer um doutorado e fui fazendo coisas assim, estou lá até agora. Em termos de córpora, eu, uh, um dos meus primeiros projetos grandes foi o Corpus Compara, não sei se vocês já ouviram falar, tipo, não, ninguém, ninguém, eu, 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 ninguém sabe. E foi aí que eu conheci a Estela, aqui a minha host, querida host e amiga de muitos anos, né? em conferência de córpora, no Talk, no CCTS, em várias conferências, a gente já se conhece e é um prazer estar aqui. Então vamos lá, I'm going to switch to English, né? e lembrei, eu falo português. <risos> Então, uh, well, let's start this with just a very brief fill in the gaps exercise. Try to do this in your minds only. Uh, just try and fill in the gaps mentally. English quite fluently, so you shouldn't have too much trouble. Um, some possible answers. Can you give me possible answers for number one? Anyone? Entirely. Entirely, yeah. Any other suggestion? Okay, there are several. Entirely is perfectly possible here. There are many other words that can fit this gap. Uh, any idea about no, gap number two? Activity prepare. Uh, prepare the activities of each group. Yeah, several words fit here. There's yeah. lots of uh, vocabulary. Uh, prepare, monitor, coordinate, organize, regulate. Lots of words fit in this gap. Number three. Any idea? Widely. 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 Ah, everyone agrees <laughs> with widely. And widely is still, it, it's as if this gap is asking for widely. 
Of course, there are other words that also fit the gap. How about number four? Show. 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 Again, the gap is craving for this word, show. But there are other words that can also be used here. What about number five? Drastic. Drastic, huge, steady, sharp, steady. steady. And what about the second gap? In. In. Ah, okay. So here we see a difference. These are lexical options, and there are quite a few that fit in. But in the second one, it's a grammatical gap, and there's only one right answer, the preposition in. What about number six? On. 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 Again, only one gap, only this is correct. So um, the, this short uh, exercise is just to uh, test your recall of collocations using the written academic English or formal English register. So these are words that we used in formal written English. Uh, collocations. Um, collocations are words that go well together, that combine well together. Um, and I will give you a formal definition in a minute. But you can see here that there are several types of collocation. Some are lexical, some are grammatical. Um, and you can see, for example, uh, some are contiguous, like in number one, clearly apparent, and some are not contiguous. So monitor the activity. So there's the article in between the verb and the noun. So you can see there are two uh, there's a gap between the two words. Uh, number three is contiguous. Number four presented in table three. So there's a little gap with a preposition intervening. And you can also note that the grammatical relations vary. In the first one, for example, we have an adverb and an adjective. In the second one is a verb plus noun. In the third one is adverb plus verb. So there are different grammatical relations here. Okay, uh, so we're talking about words that attract. So if you use apparent, you're calling for an adverb like immediately apparent or clearly apparent, uh, and so on. A formal definition, uh, and I'm using, there are several definitions of collocation, and I'm using collocation here in the Freudian sense to mean lexical items occurring together more frequently than just by chance. So let me give you an example to contextualize what this definition means. Take, for example, light increase and slight increase. There's nothing wrong with these two word combinations, a light increase, a slight increase. Both are possible in English. But if you test these combinations against the corpus, and I'm here talking specifically about academic English because I'm talking about lexicography for Brazilian researchers, um, you can see that the word light occurs very frequently in this corpus. This corpus has 70 million words. The word slight is not as frequent, it's a lot less frequent. But when you inspect how many times light occurs, one word to the left of increase, like light increase, you see it only occurs once. And when you check how many times slight occurs next to increase, it occurs 97 times. And with these values, you can statistically compute the uh, association measure between these two words. So how frequent they are, are they occurring together more frequently than just by chance? So what you have here, the log dice score is a statistical value. 0 0.07 is not statistically significant, whereas 8.92 is well above the threshold for statistical significance. 
So here you can see that slight increase occurs more frequently together than just by chance, where slight increase is just a coincidence. It's not wrong, but it's just coincidentally there in English. Uh, I won't go into the calculations of the log dice score. Uh, there are many calculators that you can use to do this statistics. Just saying that the log dice score is the one most often used in lexicography. There are other scores used for association measures. You may have heard of the T-score or the MI score. Each one has different functions, and in lexicography, we usually use the log dice score. Collocations and language learning. Collocations are notably difficult for language learners. And you can see here from the range of references from 1933 to 2023, people have been saying this and repeating this. It's really hard for language learners. And in vocabulary acquisition, when you're learning a language, uh, first you understand words, then, after you fully understand words, you begin to recognize the collocations used with those words. And only at the latest stage of vocabulary acquisition, you learn how to use collocations in your productive language vocabulary. So, in your writing, in your speaking. Uh, another problem is that learners may lack awareness of collocation constraints. So you may join words together as you do in your native language without realizing that it don't work. These combinations are not exactly the same in the target language and you may not even notice. And the problem is that clashing collocations between your first language and your target language can be particularly problematic because they can result in error. What about collocations in academic English writing? Collocations are key for effective academic English writing. Uh, there are researchers who state that users of English as an additional language, EAL, are at a linguistic disadvantage when uh, uh, competing in the research environment, international research environment, because they don't have English as a first language. Let's check this uh, with collocations. So here um, are verbs used with the uh, noun result. And uh, where is that collocate with the result in the Oxford Corpus of Academic English, which is professional published academic text in English by Oxford University Press, 70 million words. And you can see here a range of verbs that can be used as uh, when you use result as a subject, and then plus a verb, result suggests. If you compare this with how resilience English and this is the results from the Grace Corpus which was a corpus compiled using uh, English papers from Seattle so papers written by Brazilian researchers in various disciplines and published locally in Seattle um, and you can see the differences so result plus verb you can see there are fewer verbs here, collocating with results in the race corpus. There's little evidence of error. There's not, there aren't any errors. These articles that come up in Seattle, written in English by Brazilian researchers, they have been proofread and the English is okay. There's no error. But what we can observe is a limited collocation repertoire. And misconceptions about collocation strength. So we see uh, it's not wrong to say the results corroborate, but it's overused by Brazilian researchers. Corroborate is a very rare word in English. And you would much more easily and fluently say the results suggest, the results show, the results indicate, 
then the results corroborate. So there's a question here of overuse of corroborate. There's also evidence of collocation avoidance. So in English, you say the results reflect this and that. In Portuguese, you can say os resultados refletem, blah, 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 blah. You know, you can have a perfect literal translation, but Brazilians, for some reason, do not use this collocation or underuse it. The problem of collocations is not restricted to uh, users of English as an additional language. Engl uh, undergraduates in the UK who are first language speakers of English also experience collocation difficulties. And this has led many researchers starting, I think, the first one to coin the term of this expression, there are no native speakers of academic English, was Bourdieu and Passero. Because you can learn how to speak English, it doesn't mean you will be able to write academic texts in English and that you have all the collocations that you need to use in academic English coming quickly to your mind, even if English is your first language. Because exposure to your target language, English, or the target genre, an essay, a research paper, or the target register, academic, formal, it matters. And if you haven't been exposed to this in sufficient quantities, you will have trouble using it because collocations come as a, at a later stage of language acquisition. And here's just a very uh, simple example, comparing table, how it's used in general English, uh, and table, how it's used more frequently in academic English. So you see that there are differences in senses that stand out. Table is used more often uh, as a physical object, in general English, but uh, it's also used um, in, in a more, uh, he booked a table, that's not physical, right? It's uh, booking a place in a restaurant. There are several meanings in general English that prevail over the academic sense, which is a table, rows and columns in a printed text, right? And you can see also, not only the sense is different, but also the collocations are different. Grammatical collocations. In academic English, you normally use in with table. In uh, general English, the preposition that prevails is on the table. Uh, and then all the verbs, results are shown in table, uh, and there are uh, different verbs that are normally used in general English. So even if you speak, have spoken English, if you have learned English all your life, if you haven't been exposed to academic formal English, using the second one of these might come not as naturally as you would think so. Collocations can also impact how academic texts are perceived, how any text is perceived, but I'm talking specifically here about academic texts. So let me give you another example. Which of these do you think is easier to read? Number one or number two? Anyone for number one? Anyone for number two? Which one is easier? Yeah. Um, the two sentences are very, very similar. The only difference between them is that fine news is just a chance encounter. Whereas effective use is a strong, has a strong association, it's a collocation. And here, highly improve a chance encounter. It's not necessarily wrong, but it sounds a bit odd. Whereas greatly uh, improve is, has a strong association. Uh, if you are used to reading academic texts, number two should be perceived as a lot more fluent and easier to read. Collocations, that's because collocations, words that occur often together, they are read as a single item rather than word by word. So in number one, you might, you know, find use, you might need to bring the words together. 
or as effective use, you read as a chunk. And your working memory processes an item as a, of one of two or more words more efficiently than putting separate words together. So there's evidence that collocationally rich texts are perceived as more fluent and are processed with less effort. Uh, coming back to academic writing, the highly competitive world of academia, less fluent research manuscripts can be rejected just because they're harder to read, not because their content is inferior. Same thing, student essays that are harder to read can be marked down. So who can benefit from academic English collocation assistance? Uh, researchers, especially those using English as an additional language to disseminate their work internationally. Here in the case, Brazilian researchers. But also students in English medium universities or university programs. Some, there are more and more CLIL programs and uh, universities outside English speaking countries using English as a medium of uh, education. So I'm not talking just about the UK, the US, Australia, English speaking countries. Um, and when we're talking about students, especially those who are new to written academic English, like undergraduates, and especially those using English as an additional language. So where can writers get collocation assistance? Uh, there are lots of corpus-based textbooks around uh, because you can extract collocation from corpora and there have been uh, many textbooks created to teach collocations and you can see here um, three of them. Um, there are corpus-based dictionaries uh, that help you um, and here you can see a screenshot of the Macmillan Dictionary Talk, which sadly was taken offline in June because Macmillan Education has decided to stop the project. However, I can tell you after the talk where you can find the database for the Macmillan, which is still available to all of us. Uh, because this was my favorite dictionary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I and I was so yeah. sad when it was removed. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, but what you can see when you look up collocation in a dictionary, dictionaries tend to focus on language comprehension. So the first thing you see is the definition. Uh, and then if you want to find out collocation, you need to scroll down. Here you can see that this is a very good dictionary. It gives you the main collocations, the strongest collocations that it, uh, occur with research. And you can also click here and you will be linked to the Macmillan Collocation Dictionary, which will give you lots more options. So this is a really good thing. Uh, the only problem is that most learners, they are used to using a dictionary to understand words and they're not effectively trained to use dictionaries to help them in language production in writing. Uh, there are also uh, lots of collocation dictionaries uh, that have been uh, created that are dictionaries that don't give you definitions at all. They're not for language comprehension. They're for the words that you already know. And they focus just on collocations. Uh, the BBI is, I think, the first one, and it was done manually before corpora were available. But, and I had it, and I bought it in the early 80s, and it's a really good dictionary, even though it was done manually. But then in 2000, Oxford published the Oxford Collocations Dictionary, soon after Macmillan, and then Longman. Um, the Longman Dictionary even contains, at the end, uh, the academic collocations list. So uh, an appendix just with academic collocations. So you can see here the first one, uh, ability, cognitive ability, abuse, sexual abuse, accept, commonly accepted, generally accepted, and so on. 
So you can see here common academic collocations. There are also collocation search engines. So NetSpeak, for example, if you know the syntax, if you write, um, you need to be a little bit tricky because you need to find the syntagmatic slot where a verb would come up. So if you put research, question mark, anything, that, it will normally give you verbs in between. And that you can see collocations here. Research shows, suggests, but you need to understand this language. And another problem is that you don't know that these are academic texts. These, you don't know where these texts are coming from. But you really need to have a little bit of linguistic awareness to formulate strings like research, question, that, which many researchers who are not linguists do not have. Biologists, zoologists, chemists, an engineer, um, they wouldn't really think in those terms. Maybe computer scientists would, because this is already a little bit like a programming language, but um, most researchers are unaware, don't have linguistic awareness to carry out this. And um, it's not perfect. There are things that come out and don't make sense. You can see it will give you anything in between research and that. So uh, some of them are not correct. Um, Lingo uh, allows you to, instead of a question mark, specify a part of speech. So you can't say, use a verb in this gap. So if you look for verb followed by research here, um, you will get verbs followed by research. But the first one is interpreted as a verb, but market research, most commonly, you can use market to market something. But in this uh, phrase, it's probably not to market something. Market research is probably uh, a type, you know, it, it, it's a unit, market research. It's a, a noun plus a modifier. Uh, same thing with own. Own could be a verb here, but in this case, it's not. It's a pronoun. Uh, so it's not perfect, okay? Um, this is one of the oldest collocation tools available, developed by Pete White, who was a lexical engineer at Oxford University, uh, Oxford Dictionaries. Um, and it's a really good tool based on the British National Corpus. You can see that the interface is very old and it hasn't been updated. But the website is still there and you can see the results are quite good because this is based on the British National Corpus. It's a very uh, clean corpus, but it's not just academic English. You have all kinds of English. My favorite tool, uh, you've probably come across it, it's Scale, which is open, anyone can use it, sketch engine for English, uh, for language learning. And if you type the word research, and you choose the word sketch option, it will give you collocations sorted by grammatical type. So you can see verbs with research as the subject, so research suggests, research shows, research focuses, verbs with research as an object, uh, to con conduct research, to fund research, to undertake research, and many researchers who are not from linguistics this difference between research as a subject and research as an object is not clear to them. It's not something obvious. They just think a verb that I can use with research. But you see there are different verbs that you use in different contexts. And you have adjectives. And this is a very simple, very quick tool that you can use. And I use it all the time. And if you click here, you can then get Affordances from the corpus. The corpus is not, behind scale, is not an academic corpus, it's a corpus of general English. But if you're looking for a word like research, you're more likely to find formal academic words. So, and you can see here, concordances showing how to use research in context. Another solution.
crucial, and I couldn't give you this talk without mentioning generative AI. Um, the elephant in the room, right? <laughs> for us corpus linguists. Um, AI tools use large language models to improve writing by processing vast amounts of text taken from the internet. Okay? And they can improve uh, things. So let's try some AI tools with this uh, sentence taken from Brace. And you can see here, Brace is the Brazilian corpus of academic English. You can see here an overuse of results corroborate and also a mistake because corroborate is uh, transitive. And here you have the preposition the preposition is not needed in English. Yeah. Nor in Portuguese. Yes, exactly. That's, ah, that's exactly what I'm thinking. Okay, good. So you have overuse and a grammatical miscollocation, the problem of transitivity. So let's see what you get when you ask these new large language models to improve this sentence. You get this. So here, sorry, the first one, they changed corroborate into a line and they left the preposition. Not bad, is it? Uh, but for some reason they changed companies from Malaysia. They changed it to Malaysian companies. I'm not sure why. Second one, they kept corroborate but they corrected the mistake. Third option, oh, they changed corroborate into substantiate and added some words within the context of companies operating they stretched the tax they made it quite long uh, increased it quite a lot and here in the last one they changed corroborate into support and they try to keep it short and simple which of these do you like best Yeah. Four? Mm -hmm. I like four. Okay, it depends. Maybe you I were influenced by what I said, but... What, what? Yeah, I actually think that three is really posh, substantiate. Yeah, I, maybe if you were trying to impress yeah. or to show erudition, you would go for three. Uh, the other ones are not wrong, okay? Uh, they're not wrong. Number two only corrects the mistake but doesn't change the style. Mm -hmm. That maybe is what a proofreader would do. Um, number one, also not wrong, but yeah. And um, now I'll reveal this. The first one is with chat GPT and I just, the prompt was improve this sentence. The second one was with DeepL Write. Have you heard of this? Have you come across DeepL Write? You should. It's brilliant. Uh, it's like you, you all know DeepL, I presume, for translation. DeepL now has a tool called DeepL Write, which improves your English. It also improves your German. It works for English and for German. Number three, I reformulated my chat GPT prompt and I asked it, give the sentence an academic tone. And that's when they, you know, wanted to show their edition. <laughs> and the third one is DeepL Write, where you have the option to choose business style, academic style, simple style, and I said academic style. So these are the results given. So these tools, they save time, and there are many other tools, but I could go on forever. These tools, they certainly save time, but they're all black box revisions. You don't know what's happening behind the scenes. And they differ quite substantially. And I bet that if you submit the same sentence to chat GPT today, it will give you a different solution. So, you don't really know what's happening. And they lack explainability. Also, you don't control the provenance. You don't know if this is, well, you do if you ask it for an academic tone or an academic text. 
Um, but the main problem, as I see it, is that there is the risk that less proficient writers are not well equipped to evaluate texts generated by MLMs. We had a, quite a discussion in the previous slide, and you're all experts in English linguistics here in this room. And even then, we had quite a discussion. Now imagine a Brazilian researcher whose level of English is just B2, and doesn't, you know, I don't think they would be able to make an informed judgment if they're not linguists uh, about how to choose it. So um, there's this tendency to use just one NLM and to accept black box solutions passively and uncritically. Um, and to me, and I'm going to be a little bit political here, I think this gives them less control over their own vocabulary choices. And it's disempowering. They're just using something, but they don't have really control over it. But it's so easy and so tempting, isn't it? Why bother develop lexical tools to help learners to write if you can just plunk something in ChatGPT or DeepLWrite or other programs. Um, it's so easy to accept black box solutions passively and critically that my feeling is that it deprives learners of an opportunity for learning. You're just accepting, but you don't really know what's happening. It's like uh, you take an Uber and you don't really know where you're going, but you get there. But you have no idea of the route. And if you don't have Uber, you're lost, right? Um, whereas if you use a lexical tool and if you're encouraged to consult your lexical choices, a corpus or a dictionary, you have active control over your vocabulary choices. And I think lexical tools can empower less proficient writers with a means to develop a better understanding of good vocabulary choices and in this way become better and more critical users of large language models. Because I think lang large language models are brilliant for experts. I can, I can use it all the time because I have English proficiency. I'm bilingual in English and Portuguese, and I can tell when the English is not good, and I have control, and I can say to chat GPT, this is not good enough, reformulate my prompt, and so on. But if you just are using LLMs and critically, you won't be able to develop this awareness. Back to lexical tools and resources offering collocation help. You have these EAP textbooks that I showed earlier. They're good for learning about collocation and understanding what collocation is and browsing collocations related to a topic because normally they're organized into topics of collocations relevant to studying the environment, collocations used frequently in business, and so on. Uh, but you know, these books can only cover a tiny bit of collocations, very limited coverage, and they're not practical to consult during writing, they're not organized in an alphabetical order, they're not really used for as a reference. Then you have general dictionaries, which are better for using as a reference, so they're practical. Um, but People are more used to consulting dictionaries for meanings than for writing assistance. So people need to be trained to use dictionaries for writing. And the other problem with dictionaries is collocation is not the first thing that users normally see in a, in a dictionary entry. And they might just look at the definition and forget the rest. Plus, dictionary users may need to be taught how to find collocation help in dictionaries. 
which word to use. You need to find which is the collocation node or which is the word that governs the collocation and look that up in dictionary to be able to use a dictionary efficiently for collocation L. Collocation dictionaries go right straight to the point, so they're really useful, but their focus is on general English, not on academic English. And they have limited academic English coverage. Um, even the London Academic Collocation List, used in the, shown in the appendix to the London Dictionary of Collocations, has only 2,469 collocations. And I'll come back to this number because it is quite limited. Then you have these automatic collocation tools that we saw, like Lingo, Netspeak, uh, Scale, and they can have offer more coverage. Uh, but uh, noisy data, you know, you need to be able to get what you want from that very clearly, especially tools like Netspeak and Lingo. And it's easy for users who are researchers who are not linguists to misinterpret the results or get distracted with too much information including corpus tools like just the word and scale, they may contain too much information. Other issues. Learners tend to overestimate their knowledge of collocations. So they will not look up collocations if they're not aware of their limitations. Why would you look up a collocation if you didn't know that there was something wrong in your text? And these limitations are not just errors, they can also be atypical word combinations like light increase, it's not an error, but it's odd. And include less visible problems like the ones we saw in brace, collocation underuse, limited collocation repertoire, and collocation overuse, because writers who underuse certain collocations tend to overuse the fewer ones that they know. And even when learners are aware of their limitations, looking at collocations can interrupt thoughts and flow of words. And this is especially complicated during cognitively demanding tasks like academic writing. You don't want to stop your writing, your ideas flowing to look up a collocation. So how can we provide collocation assistance during writing? Uh, Collocate is a tool uh, we developed uh, with funding from the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council. And um, we developed this tool in collaboration. I developed it in collaboration with Professor Robert Lev and Jonathan Roberts and with brilliant researchers, uh, postdoc researchers, Gerent, Peter, and Mirvan. Um, and uh, very quickly, this is what Colgate is about.
a demo of an older version. Hope it has been updated since, but I haven't got a new video. Um, what's different about Collocate? It can help writers expand their collocation repertoire by providing reminders and suggestions of collocations that writers don't remember. So every time you see a word underlined, you can have a suggestion. If you don't need a reminder, you can just ignore it and carry on writing. But if you want to explore and expand your vocabulary, you can find suggestions that you don't remember, that you use less frequently, that you don't feel confident enough to use, or even suggestions of words that you can be avoiding. And the thing about collocate is that Unlike LLMs, they don't really know where the text is coming from, the lexical data is curated, and writers don't get distracted by information that's hard to find, irrelevant, misleading, or too much. Another thing is that it's based on data-driven learning. So locations are shown, they're not explained. Learners like learning by examples. Uh, it's the, this constructivist approach to language learning uh, where you discover things by yourself. And corpus examples are added to help. So corpus examples, learners uh, seem to help learners understand how a word is used in context. And it seems there's evidence that multiple examples at the same time help to clinch it more than just a single example. So in Colocate we provide three examples of the same location. And there is this interactive text editor integration, which is not perfect, but uh, it has been informed by human computer interaction so that you are able to uh, interact with the system. So here with our famous sentence, if you click here on results, the um, tool asks you first to disambiguate whether you mean results as a noun or results as a verb because the corpus is not, uh, we don't parse your text, this makes the system faster, but it's very easy to disambiguate. If you choose results as a noun, it will give you the strongest verb used with the result. Uh, as a subject, the strongest verb used with a uh, result as an object, uh, the strongest adjective or modifier, and then the prepositions that can be used with result. So in this case, you're looking for result and the verb used as an object. If you're not happy with indicate, you could like indicate and just use it there and there, but if you want to see more, you can expand this. So you can interact with the system in a phased way, as much or as little as you want. And if you want to see examples, you can click and it will give you three examples to help you use the word and give you more confidence in using this word. Um, so now uh, a little bit about the lexicography behind Colocate. Um, our starting point, uh, what was our starting point? Um, which of these two questions are writers more likely to ask? Number one or number two? Number two, right. You don't, you, you start with one idea, one concept in your mind, and then you're looking for the collocations around it. You don't start with a collocation and try to find where to plump it in your text. It just doesn't make sense psychologically. Um, let me tell you that the starting point for the London Academic Collocation List was one. So they got a corpus and they extracted the strongest collocations from the corpus. The starting point for collocate was two, uh, the collocation node. So what we wanted to find was words that researchers use frequently and then give them the collocations around those words rather than give them a list of ready-made collocations. And our focus was on nouns, verbs, and adjectives because you tend to 
start your thoughts from nouns, verbs, and adjectives. You don't really start a thought from an adverb or from a preposition an or a, an article or so on. And we wanted to, uh, we thought we had time to cover in the project 500 uh, noun, verbs, and adjectives, and we wanted to identify the most useful ones used in general academic English, so they could be used by researchers from different disciplines. And this is quite ambitious, because if each node, each node like research, has 10 collocates, you end up with 5,000 collocations, which is twice as much as the academic collocation list. So let's see how far we got. Uh, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, because there are lots of academic word lists already available. So we chose to look at three well-established word lists of academic English vocabulary. And the three lists have been extracted using different methods in different corpora. And we wanted to build on the strengths of each list. So for note selection, we used the academic keyword list, which are words that are especially salient in academic English when compared with general English. We used a subset of the academic vocabulary list, which is very large, uh, that overlaps with the whole corpus, uh, which is a corpus of student writing in Britain. So we wanted words that are used by students a lot. So this subset of AVL help us focus on words that students find uh, useful. And then we used the academic collocations list because of the way it was extracted, it focuses on strong collocations. So we used these three lists, we combined them, uh, and ta -da! when we combined the list, we found that we had exactly 514 verb, noun, and adjectives overlapping in at least two lists. So we said, wow, this is a great starting point for us. It meets our project timing and our budget. So that's what we decide to use. Which collocations? Uh, then we focused on words that would likely to be looked up for each node. So uh, for nouns as subject, we looked at verbs like research. We wanted to find verbs that could be used with research. Uh, we wanted to use verbs that could be used with research as an object. Uh, we wanted to use, uh, provide adjectives and modifiers for nouns. We wanted to provide adverbs for adjectives and adverbs for verbs, and prepositions used with verbs. Okay, so these are all words that might be words that writers might have a blank and might want to look up when they're writing. Which sources? Uh, this time we used expert academic English corpora, uh, because the quality of the corpus are only as good as the corpus, and this is a quote in Sinclair. And we started out with the Pearson International Corpus of Academic English, which was used by Longman, and they shared the data with us. But then we obtained permission to use the Oxford Corpus of Academic English, which is a much better corpus, we found out. And then towards maybe three months in, four months in, after we started compiling our database, we switched to the Oxford Corpus. But the first few collocations were compiled using the Pearson Corpus. So the Oxford Corpus contains 70 million words, published academic papers and books, 26 disciplines, quite a good variety. Which tools? We use Sketch Engine. It's a, school, it's a tool favored by lexicographers, all the major dictionary. Uh, Publishers use Sketch Engine, Oxford, Cambridge, London, Robert. Um, if you're working professionally with lexicography, you're using Sketch Engine. And we use the Word Sketch facility, which sorts collocations by grammar relations. So you can specifically 
request for, for example, what adjectives are used with research. And you get something like that. And you also get the stats here. So you can see that qualitative research occurs 1,522 times in the 70 million word corpus. And you get the strength of association of dice measure. And you can see this is a very strong association. Um, which examples? Uh, we used uh, the GoodEx facility of Sketch Engine, which automatically uh, sorts collocations, uh, concordances, by penalizing concordances that are very long or that contain rare words. So they automatically show them last. And they bump up, prioritize concordances with whole short sentences with a target collocation in the main code which makes it easier for us because they normally provide better dictionary examples. You don't want dictionary examples that are very hard to read. You want dictionary examples that are quite simple to read. We post-edited uh, the concordances. They were shortened. They were anonymized because the corpus contains many names because it's an academic corpus, so lots of references to authors. Uh, we, when we were in doubt, we chose examples that could be used in more than one discipline. And when possible, we used examples that shows collocation cues. For example, some collocations were used only in the passive, so we used it to show the examples in the passive. And how many examples? You can see here three examples because multiple examples are more helpful. Uh, I now like to discuss some non-trivial lexicography issues that came up. First, when we were selecting the node, if you look here, we've had 500 nodes uh, that intersected in at least two lists. But if you look at the intersection of the three lists, only 187 nodes. Even, they even though they cover general academic English, they are a lot less similar than English. Uh, only 16% of the lemmas were in common to all three lists. Another problem was that, um, what's missing here? This is uh, verbs used with research as object. Can you see anything wrong here? Conduct research, undertake research, fund research. Is any verb missing? Do research is used, but it's more oral, informal, so it's not in the written academic corpus. It doesn't show up. Carry but, out. Yes, carry out research. Okay, and it, it is quite significant co-occurrence in the corpus, but it's not showing. That's because the space between carry out phrasal verbs. It's problematic in word sketches, and it doesn't always capture that. So you have to. Be aware that word sketches might have a problem with phrasal verbs. And there were other examples of things that you use in the Pedetic English that were missed. Another problem. You can see here that word sketches, we've seen, they sort collocates according to grammar relations. So here you have the word argument and verbs that collocate strongly with argument and prepositions that collocate strongly with argument. Uh, but when you look at how language is used in real life, collocation gaps sometimes take more than one grammar relation. Look at this example, an argument about the decision, the gap is a preposition, an argument over the decision, another preposition, an argument concerning the decision. And this is a verb, it's a delexilized verb, but it is a verb. Argument regarding the decision is also a verb. So um, in, when we were developing a collocate, we made a decision to remove concern from the verb paradigm and to move it as concerning to the prepositional paradigm. The same thing with regard. It was not being used as a verb here. It was being used as the preposition regarding. So we had to manually edit lots of things in the corpus. 
Uh, example selection issues. You can see here, if you get examples from good eggs or undertake activity, you see the first example is really good, but it's in the active voice. And sometimes you tend to just take the first example when you're working quickly. But undertake, and you can see uh, here, is primarily used in the passive voice. So if you're using good X, you might have to take a look at what's the most common grammatical realization of this location, and it's the passive. So we learned some lexicography lessons the hard way. Uh, first point was that word lists aiming for similar vocabulary coverage, or epidemic vocabulary, can differ quite substantially depending on the corpora and extraction methods used. Second, that word lists disregard how words are used in context. So we found that words like no were missing from our lists because it's very prevalent in general language, you know, I don't know. So they were not, it didn't show up in academic word lists when expressions like phrases like it is widely known are quite common, but they get diffused, they don't get any emphasis in word lists because no is a very common verb in general language. Another problem was word lists disregard sense distinctions. So academic words which have other non-academic senses are given less weight. So table was missing from our initial note selection. Table is a really important word in academic English, but because it has a non-academic sense, it was not shown in the academic word lists we used. And then, the opposite of that, words that were polysemous, that had more than one sense, were given a lot of weight. So because the word code, for example, occurs in computer science, in biology, in linguistics, it had an inflated frequency in general academic word lists. But it's not as common. It's used in a very specific sense in different disciplines. So code appeared in our note list, but table didn't. It didn't make sense. Um, now there are experiments in the latest ELEX conference. I saw some experiments with automatic sense distinctions coming up, which might help with this problem. So other problems was that collocation tools missed out words, multi-word units like carry out, and uh, did not capture aspects of language complexity. Uh, which you need a human to interpret, like, you know, about and regarding the preposition and the verb being used interchangeably in the same syntagmatic gap. Also, tools to facilitate good dictionary examples must be used with care, and you have to be careful uh, to reflect common grammatical patterns and uh, undertaken. And this, there was a presentation by uh, Professor Robert Lev, showing that if you ask LLMs to give you good dictionary examples, they always give you the, blah, blah, simple tense, and it's always the same very simple sentence, and, and they're not uh, really reflecting the real usage of the words. They give you the simple sentence, but they don't reflect the simple words. So, lessons. These Cutting-edge corpus tools like Sketch Engine, which is used in lexicographer, they can be super helpful and we wouldn't have been able to do this project without the use of these tools. But you still need to use them critically, uh, otherwise you can be misled and mistaken. So here is where good old-fashioned linguistic judgment is necessary in lexicography. And you do all this, so that when the end user, who is not a linguist, it's a, it's a biologist, it, it, it's an astrophysicist, it's writing in English, they don't have to worry because the data has been curated and scrutinized by a lexicographer. So our final uh, version of database. We originally had 514 notes. We expanded it to 572 to include 
go the missing words that we felt were really important from the intersection of word lists. Um, we provide over 32,000 collocation suggestions, so that's considerably more than you find in the academic collocation list. And we provide almost 30,000 uh, curated corpus examples, uh, but we also provide links to further examples from scale. So if you're not enough from our examples, this is very painstaking words, selecting good dictionary examples, we provide an external link. So does Collocate help writers? Uh, early versions of the prototype were rated between good and excellent on a system usability scale. Collocate was, felt, was shown to be less demanding than other collocation tools and resources. Um, so when compared with dictionaries, machine translation, lingui, anything that learners wanted to use, uh, Rees did this experiment and found that measuring against the NASA task load index, that Colgate was less effortful to use. Um, we did an experiment with Brazilian researchers um, back in 2019 and we recently published uh, the results and academic writers and English teachers at Brazilian universities, they said they were very likely to continue using the tool. And one year later, 54% of the writers and 93% of the teachers did indeed continue to use the tool. And this is quite, in, quite good figures. You might think 54% is not good, but one year later, it means that 50 4% of the writers gain an awareness of collocation, what collocation is, and understood how to look it up and were using it in their writing. And 93% of the teachers were using it in their teaching uh, when some, some of the teachers in the program were not teaching anymore, hence uh, this difference. But the above studies are only about self-reported uh, observations. So this is what just users say they think they're doing. So recently, I did a study with um, Thomas Mishta from the Bialystok University in Poland, who was with me at Surrey for a visiting fellowship last year. And he looked at uh, 27 final year students of English at the University of Bialystok in Poland and asked them to revise a six hundred word extract of their dissertations with Colocate before it was seen by their tutors or their supervisors. And we found by looking, observing in detail which revisions they made with Colocate that the tool provided really good coverage. 36% uh, of the nouns used. Of course, it doesn't cover nouns specific to linguistics because it covers only language, general language. So 36% is very good for the, these dissertations. 40% of the verb used and 90% of the adjectives. And we also found that the writers exercise critical judgment in using collocate. So 54% of the suggestions were accepted and 46% ignored. So they were not using the tool indiscriminately like uh, chat GPT. They were really thinking about whether they should use a suggestion or not. And then we evaluated the outcome of their changes with Collocate and 50% of the changes made improved the fluency and idiomaticity of their texts. Uh, 40% made it worse, really, but 8 and 8% 8 were unnecessary, they didn't need to revise because what was good remained good. 28% we couldn't judge because we didn't have enough context to see if the change, uh, but 50% is actually quite a good statistic. More user feedback. Uh, People here, researchers in the Brazilian workshops at Burgis and UNESP, said it was very user-friendly, it's intuitive, and they liked the fact that it was interactive and progressive. Um, 
and that you didn't waste time looking up in several resources. You had one place to look. Uh, and the fact that it gave academic English suggestions that were relevant to them and that they would be able to find out on their own. There was some negative feedback um, about, they were asking for more notes to be asked, more suggestions in collocate, like words from specific areas. So you could develop a collocate for astrophysicists with astro terms used in astrophysics but we didn't get that. Um, it was not our priority. We wanted to focus at this stage in general English. They asked us to install an auto-saving mechanism. Uh, we weren't able to do that. Uh, um, this was just a research prototype. It's not a full tool. And we also, there's also data protection issues and data privacy because we don't even have access to the text you're writing. We give you access to our database, but we can't see your texts. So there's no way we can save them anywhere. Uh, we did add an export to text function, but the best way is just to copy and paste to your regular text editor. Maybe it could be compatible with text editors you use daily, like Microsoft Word. And we couldn't agree more. And I'm happy to say uh, I've applied for funding to do precisely that, to develop an integration of the Collocate da database with Microsoft Word and with Google Docs. And uh, fingers crossed, I don't know if I will get the funding, but uh, we will maybe, and then you can use just uh, the best of Collocate without using our prototype directly from Word and Google Docs. Um, because we feel users shouldn't have to leave their writing environments to use Collocate. So to access Collocate, the prototype is free to use. You just need to register. We have nearly 9,000 registered users from all over the world. They include mostly postgraduate students, but also undergraduate students and established researchers and language teachers, and both users of English as a first language and users of English as an additional language. Here are some key publications related to the project, um, if you want to follow up. And we also share the data. Here's a sample of the data so that you can see how we organized our lexical data. If you're interested in accessing the full data, you need to get in touch with us and we need to establish a copyright agreement so that you can use the full data. People from the eLexis project have used the full data in their Word of Games app through an agreement. But the sample is good for you to see if the data is what you need. Uh, we also provide for free uh, common collocation errors and problems and also the source code files and documentation, although the source code can be streamlined uh, here. I'd like to just to finish off with a little bit of the future of lexicography for English academic writing, based on Rufus S. Gauss uh, data pulling and data pushing dichotomy. Ideally, I think in the future, writers need to be able to pull information efficiently. So the writers have questions and their tools need to be able to give them efficient answers. But at the same time, tools need to push meaningful suggestions. Even when writers don't have questions, uh, the tools need to help writers when they don't know that they need help. Um, and this is something that I can proudly um, present here, which is Gustavo's here, PhD here. He developed a fantastic tool for Brazilian researchers, which is called Scribo. And here is a copy of the interface of Scribo, where here on the left, you can see data pool. So here, what you have is the Manchester Academic Phrase Bank. I don't know if you've used it before, but incorporated into this database, you can find ways of writing an introduction, reviewing the literature, common sentences used for all these different
different uh, moves, uh, sections of an academic text, and within the section there are different moves and so on. Here on the right, you also have data pool, when writers can look up and initiate pull things from the tool. And here you have corpora, very good academic corpora that Gustavo built. And you can actually uh, look up sentences with and get concordances with a sentence only from highly um, cited academic texts. So it's not just any corpus, it's a good academic English corpus. And you can compare concordances to see which uh, concordance is more common in, two, in academic English. There's also machine translation incorporated. In, in, if you can't remember how to say something, you can use machine translation here on this interface. And there's a dictionary that you can, uh, just a normal dictionary. And the best thing about this tool is the data push. And this is the folk, this is just what Gustavo started. It looks like a lot of work. But this is just what Gustavo started with. What I'm really proud of is his data push interface. So when you're writing inside here this context, you can use the left to look at phrases, the right to look at corporate dictionaries, translations, and in the middle you get suggestions. And how does this work? It analyzes your academic English text, and Gustavo, who is a computer scientist, developed an intralingual machine translation engine for Brazilian researchers writing in English which automatically transforms imperfect English into improved academic English and displays the changes as suggestions. It doesn't automatically give you something like ChatGPT. It just gives you suggestions which you can incorporate or not into your text. So try it out. I think it's still live, isn't it? I don't know, I'm not, not sure, not sure, because we need to talk about it, because okay. it's still hosted at CTS. Uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> but I think it should be live, and uh, you can try it out. And what's the, the URL? Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that. Um, just some announcements before I shut up. Um, we have a webinar uh, on the 24th of January, if you're interested, it's a remote webinar. Uh, and you can uh, register here uh, how AI is changing translation and interpreting practice and it's a joint uh, seminar hosted by the Institute for Translation and Interpreting and uh, but led by my colleagues at the University of Surrey. I think it's not free, if only if, it's only free if you're a member of the ITI but the fee should not be very expensive. Mistrado uh, PHD in Surrey. Agora vou falar português. O nosso centro de tradução na Universidade de Surrey. Nós temos mestrados de um ano que incluem português e inglês. Vocês todos aqui acho que já passaram na fase de mestrado, mas se tiverem alunos de graduação interessados. Uh, Nós temos o mestrado em tradução, em interpretação e em tradução e interpretação. E as candidaturas estão abertas, início em setembro. Para esse, os mestrados, nós normalmente não temos bolsas, acho que tem uma bolsa na universidade inteira, é bem difícil. Também nós temos doutorados de três anos de duração, aqui está um exemplo do nosso uh, doutorando que obteve bolsa. As candidaturas são abertas em permanência. Eu estou aceitando alguns novos de doutorado. E a novidade, nós vamos é, oferecer bolsas para começar os paramentos em setembro do Liverhill Doctoral Scholarships. Tem que ser na área de Media Accessibility through Human Centered Uses of Language and Translation Technology. Mas uh, é uma uh, oportunidade. E se vocês quiserem, no nosso site tem mais informações. Por último, 
Desculpa, se vocês quiserem tirar a foto aqui. Uh, nós fazemos parte do consórcio do mestrado europeu em lexicografia, não sei se vocês conhecem, mas isso é uma oportunidade para os alunos uh, daqui, de, que estão terminando a graduação. São mestrados de dois anos de duração, lecionado em alemão e inglês. Uh, é um mestrado itinerante em várias universidades europeias. Então, aqui na esquerda são as universidades principais. Nós somos, por causa do Brexit, somos só membros associados. Nós damos palestras, partes dos cursos, organizamos eventos, mas nós não temos os alunos. Então, os alunos normalmente fazem dois semestres numa universidade uh, fixa, na universidade host, uh, anfitriã, uma dessas. E vocês podem ver a Universidade do Minho, no norte de Portugal, e a Universidade de Santiago de Compostela. Uh, são oportunidades ótimas para alunos brasileiros. Uh, e também vão passar um semestre em uma dessas outras universidades. E, melhor de tudo, bolsas disponíveis, bolsas ótimas disponíveis para alunos da América do Sul. Bolsas completas com a, a FI, como é que fala FI em português? A propina? <risos> Isso é português de Portugal, não é? é. Propina é uma coisa bem diferente. É. 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 Ah, bom, os custos e uma mensalidade de 1.400 euros por mês e tudo. Só que as inscrições estão abertas até dia 1 de março. Então, quem estiver interessado uh, tem que ir no bloco. Mais informações estão aqui no site do mestrado IMLEX, European Masters of Lexicography. Aí o foco é a lexicografia mesmo, um, mas se tiver interessado. Ok, terminou. Obrigada.